And the real essence is that we want to construct invariants. We want our amplitudes to be invariant under symmetries. And just for reference, let's write S of two Z. Sometimes there's a P here that has to do with identifying the identity or minus the identity. The P actually doesn't appear if you include Z because the inversion acts on Z. So depending on whether or not you have a marked point, you may or may not have the P here. But in any case, I will not be too particular about that right now. This is called a gamma for modular. And there are subgroups of the modular group. If I present a two by two matrix C D with these are integers, then of course the SL, the special condition means that A D minus B C equals one. And since these are integers, this is kind of a number theoretically interesting condition. Just try it for a few integers and see what it means for you. There are famous subgroups like the congruence subgroups that are highly relevant for orbifolds. So if you're in a ZN orbifold, you might actually naturally encounter a congruence subgroup. The only condition is that N divides C. So this entry C in the matrix, if N divides C, then that's a subgroup of this original group. And uh, that's of, of some interest in general. But for now, let's just focus on the modular group itself. And the modular group is generated by S transformation, which is tau goes to minus one or tau, and T transformation, which is tau goes to tau plus one. And these two generate this group. So you can build up any S of two Z matrix by these two transformations. And this transformation acts as alpha tau plus B, C tau plus D. Sometimes this is written as gamma times tau, even though this is not a matrix multiplication, this is just a number. So this is just a symbol for that. All right, so what about that differential equation? The differential equation is again, the Laplace equation, but it is the Laplace equation in tau. So the non-homomorphic Eichstein series as a function of tau is an eigenfunction. So there are different conventions here. They could be a plus or minus, but let's just write something like this. Now, this Laplacian is in curved space. So when we first encountered this, it seems a little surprising. How did this suddenly become curved? We were on a torus, and we can always pick a flat metric on a two torus. And one way to think about that, there are many sort of ways to see why you're talking about the curved metric on the upper half plane, is that the fundamental region for these transformations, the imaginary part of tau has to be greater than zero. So we're in the upper half plane. And a fundamental region means that you should find a region in the upper half plane where every point of tau that is not represented somewhere else is represented and no point is ever represented twice. And as probably many of you know, this, is, this region is the standard choice. This is the keyhole shape fundamental region, curly F of the upper half plane tau. One way to see this from this picture that this is a curved space is that this is a geodesic. In the curved space metric on the upper half plane, this is the differential operator. Sorry, that should be the index tau two squared. So this Laplacian sub tau squared has a factor here. And those of you who know about ADS of t, you may be familiar with this, that this looks a lot like ADS2 in the Poincaré metric. This is the upper half plane curved Laplacian that looks like this. And the claim is when I act with this differential operator on my non-homomorphic Eichstein series, I discover that it's an eigenfunction. So this is a constant. And this is invariant. This is an invariant differential operator. The Laplace operator is invariant when it's applied to scalars. So here we really have an object that's invariant under the modular group. And it satisfies a invariant differential equation. You can, of course, now just apply this to this double sum I gave. But there's a much better way to do it, which is to build it up through Poincaré series. And that's what we'll talk about the rest of today. So my plan is to introduce how you build up Poincaré series. And this is from Poincaré's PhD thesis for the students out there. And I find that this old math is much easier for physicists to read than more modern math. So this, I strongly recommend reading some old 
things like Poincaré's own papers. So what we do is to construct non-morphic eigenstance series by Poincaré series. But since we already have these objects, of course, the reason I'm doing this is that this is generally applicable in other cases, and then not just constructing the thing we already have. And then you naturally get automorphic forms because to a physicist, this is basically the method of images, which is a way to construct something that has a symmetry that it previously didn't have. This can be useful, I think, also from the point of view of ADCFT, though I'm not doing ADCFT here. So we're trying to compute the action of SF2Z on tau and then taking the imaginary part and eventually raising to power s. But let's start with just taking the imaginary part. So I claim that the imaginary part of this transformed tau, this is just how you would think, nothing strange to compute the imaginary part. I think everybody can do this, but let me do it because you know, otherwise you may not get around to doing it and then you miss much of what goes on after this. So you multiply upstairs and downstairs by the bar of this thing. So you get something real here. And now we multiply it out. So you get AC tau squared plus AD tau plus BC tau bar plus BD and then divide by C tau plus D squared. I forgot to write the imaginary part. These two pieces will not contribute. So you come from here. So if we plug in that tau is tau one plus i tau two for the real imaginary parts, we guess imaginary part of something real plus a d i tau two minus b c i tau two divided by this thing there. So you see the imaginary part of something real plus this stuff with the i here, where i is square root of minus one, you get a d minus b c tau two over this stuff. Because AD minus BC is one in SL, we just get tau two over C tau plus D squared. So we see that tau two itself transforms into this whole thing. It's called form because this is a form. So this is a differential form and this has a transformation property. And this is a function of tau that has a transformation property. And you can combine them to make an invariant volume element on the upper half plane. It helps us because we can now sum this seed function, tau 2 to the s, over, in principle now, s of 2z, or the modular group. But this doesn't work because it diverges. And you can see that because this doesn't depend on, for example, b. The t transformation we said changes tau by tau plus one. So there's a B is non-zero in the T transformation. There's an infinite sequence of shifts of the fundamental region and they all give the same contribution. So they add up to infinity. But one way to fix this problem is just to divide up by something called gamma infinity, which in general is a Borel subgroup more generally. So it's sometimes denoted like B. And here is just this subgroup, plus minus one, plus minus one, zero, and then some integer m. So if you identify matrices that are related by this action, then you get a sum that you can actually perform that is finite. And then you get E s. So E s tau is sum over this gamma divided by this Borel of the seed function sigma tau, where sigma tau is just imaginary part of tau to the s. So this means that this object is invariant. And now we have the beautiful corollary that because the Laplace operator is invariant, all we have to do to compute the Laplace operator acting on the non-homomorphic Eisenstein series is to act on the seed. So if we act on the seed function, we see that tau one annihilates the imaginary part of tau. And we only get a contribution from here. Differentiating once, you get s in front and then decrease s by one. Differentiate again and get another thing in front. And they multiply by two powers, so you get back to the original power. So we see that the seed function is an eigenfunction 
of the curved space the plus operator with this eigenvalue and an eigen automorphic form of the Laplace operator is also called a mass form. The definition of automorphic form doesn't really specify what the differential operator should be, but mass form it specifies that it should be some Laplace operator. So yeah, so to summarize what we did was if you have this Poincaré construction, then you can just work with the seed and then you get an invariant. So here's a question. What about the Q series? Q series, I mean that the Eisenstein series S, because it has a symmetry tau goes to tau plus one, you could attempt to expand it in Fourier waves. So just like what we did Fourier waves in Z, we could also try Fourier waves in tau one. So it's very important not, not to confuse Z, which is my word sheet coordinate, which is a marked point on the torus or rather the holomorphic distance between two points, as I said, it is not the complex structure, which is a parameter that characterizes the shape of the torus. So now I'm doing Fourier wave in tau, just because I know I have this symmetry in SL2, then I might expect this kind of expansion. And if it was holomorphic, then I can actually complete this to Q to the end where q is e to the 2 pi i tau. But again, question mark, because this was not holomorphic. And this may not be strictly true, since if q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau, that means that tau is, of course, log q over 2 pi i. So it is not guaranteed they have a nice expansion like this, a q type expansion, a free expansion. But it turns out you will almost have one up to some small pretty simple terms. And the best way I think to, to get the Q series for the non-homorphic Eisenstein series is to first do my homework problem 1.1. So the very first homework problem I assigned is about the holomorphic Eisenstein series, which is denoted the same way. It's very similar to the other one, but it's instead of MN with absolute value, it is now just a regular parenthesis there. It's probably power S in this convention. And then computing the Q series for this, which has an honest to God Q series. Whereas this one has almost a Q series and it's slightly more complicated. It's about the tau one free expansion of the non-homorphic Eisenstein series. And the main reference here, reference flag at all book. And I think it's fair that number theorists should be interested in numbers, right? And my purpose of this little mini course is that at the end of the day, you should be able to get some numbers out of these seemingly abstract objects. So here I define this uh, double sum. I pick the case S equals four. This E4 object, I plot it for some values. And it has this um, reasonably nice shape. Where I set tau one equal to minus 0.4 and I plot for the different values of tau two. I restricted to a sum of a co-prime integers K and L. Why should these integers, sometimes I call them K and L, sometimes I call them M and N, same thing. Why should they be co-prime? Well, think of it this way. The condition we had, if D and C are not co-prime, but they have a common factor, let's take out that common factor. Let's call it factor F. So this doesn't mean function, it means factor. So if you have a common factor, an integer here from D and C that I just took out, you don't have a lot of hope of satisfying this condition that it should be equal to one. Did you get that argument? You can demand that they should be co-prime when you do this sum. But it's good to experiment what happens if you take away this if statement in my sum. So this is the non-homorphic Eisenstein series as a function of tau two by just this double sum construction. And I won't go through the whole file, but just to give you an idea of what I'm doing here. First, I make sure that nothing depends on the parameter B. B is one of the entries in the SL2Z matrix. So this refers to specific expressions in appendix D in the flag at all book. So this helps you check that. But then concretely what you do is you have to solve some of these number theory type conditions, mod C calculations. And I give you some examples of how that works. And mathematically I can do the required integrals for you. And then I check that the two curves are the same. So the orange curve is the one I get from the Q series and the blue curve, which is under it, 
is the one you get from the straight up computation. So the first few times I try this, I always get the wrong factor. So it helps you normalize your things consistently and make sure you know what you're doing. And this is my implementation in Mathematica of the close to month sum. And again, I'm not doing this to necessarily promote using Mathematica per se. Some people like other tools, but the good thing about using some computer tool. So I think it's a good exercise to, in any language, try to implement something like a non-homomorphic Eisenstein series, some language, and it will force you to be explicit about how you're computing things. So the summary of what I did in the lecture one Mathematica file, an expansion of the non-homomorphic Eisenstein series in the sense that I gave up here. So I expand in this and form a Fourier sum. I see now that I forgot the n. e to 2 pi i tau 1 is my Fourier basis wave. Why should I care about this? Well, like I said, it's just one first gymnastics exercise you might want to do when you get used to these things. It could be a useful approximation scheme. Next lecture, when we actually really get started, we would like to compute threshold corrections, which to mathematicians give you theta lifts. Threshold corrections are theta lifts. And to compute these and to get numbers out, numbers, I mean, actual numbers like, you know, minus 0.8, to get numbers out of threshold corrections, you need to know how to evaluate these functions. And of course, you can ask Mathematica to do it, but it doesn't yet know a lot about these things. I expect in the future it will. But for now, we have to construct them ourselves. And as I was hinting before, I think it's a good exercise to construct them explicitly so you can get some number out.